Welcome, everybody. It's delightful to have you with us. We're very pleased. This is the webinar for the Person Center Planning Initiative from Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. Today, we have John O'Brien, who is with us, and um, an extraordinary uh, creator and writer and presenter around person center planning for decades. Just a few little um, um, background pieces. Uh, we have Spanish translation. Uh, if you need that, you need to roll your cursor down to the bottom where it says interpretation and click on that and you can bring up Spanish language. <laughs> Anybody can do that. It's a toggle you can turn up should you wish to see it. Secondly, uh, unfortunately, our closed caption system um, has failed um, from the company that we're using and they have had it go down around the world on their system. So we're unfortunately not able to provide that. We've had that working very well, um, but not today. We will put closed captioning in the uh, recording that we're doing that uh, anybody who needed it can see it or you can share with, with other people as we're, as, we're, as we're doing that. So we will be taking questions and answers and John will stop uh, somewhere along the way and uh, be taking that. So as you look, there are two places. If you look down at the bottom, if you roll your cursor down to the bottom, it'll say Q&A. And right there, you can pose questions that we'll be uh, sharing with John as he uh, takes them. And then the chat box itself is where you can uh, do hellos to anybody or any technical issues or problems or things that you might have. So with that, um, we'll begin. Um, I have the great honor and pleasure of knowing John for many, many, many years. I've been in um, many dozens of his workshops. He is an extraordinary pre presenter. And we are very, very fortunate to have him sharing with us. John has done a lot of work in Nebraska um, and has a large commitment and interest in what we're doing and furthering person-centered planning in Nebraska. John's a really deep thinker about the meaning of person-centered planning far beyond a plan, but person-centered to um, create better lives for people. So with that, let me turn it over to you, John, and uh, you'll share your screen and we'll be, we'll be off to... Uh, it's John O'Brien. John, you're on. John, you got to unmute yourself. You. You have to unmute yourself, John. There we go. Sorry. We can hear you fine, John. All right. I did have a chance to spend some time in Nebraska, but it was a very long time ago. Uh, more than 20 years, I think. And I'm really happy to have the chance to think with you a little bit about the difference that person-centered planning can make. In the introduction to this uh, series, uh, Ms. Larson made the point that this project is focused on long-term change and that we're looking for greater agency, greater ex inclusion, greater freedom. And Mr. Green made a point that what the system now offers, what your system now offers, may not match what everyone who wants to benefit from that system wants. And the process that we're gonna need to go through to assure a better match is going to require new forms of thinking. So if we think about these words, freedom, choice, inclusion, independence, person-centered planning, new ways of thinking, anybody who's been around very long is entitled to ask the question, haven't we been doing this for years? Isn't this what we're doing? And I think uh, that's an important observation. 
it's an important observation for two or three reasons. One reason is that three generations of concerted effort to make these words real hasn't been enough. Uh, many, many, many people with disabilities are living lives that were unimaginable 20, 30 years ago. I've been doing this uh, for 52 years now, trying to figure out how people with developmental disabilities can live these words in their real lives. So one reason to make this observation is that three generations hasn't yet been enough. We're going to need to keep working at it. The other reason to make this observation is to raise a question. And that is, we've been doing this for years, but despite all that effort, despite that all that accomplishment, is better possible? Can we, in fact, do better at all these things? And one thing that I've observed as people are listening to messages like those that began your training sessions, messages like those that are contained in the community rule that is intended to govern the way Medicaid funds are expended through home and community-based waivers. A lot of people have responded to those possibilities by saying, we're already doing it. We're all done. It's already happening. We just have to explain it to you. That puts a period after the, we've been doing this for years. And I'd like to make sure that we keep a question mark in place. So, there are many, many methods of person-centered planning. Uh, and I'm not gonna talk about methods today. I'm gonna think with you about what I see as common threads in person-centered planning and the different kinds of difference that it can make. So person-centered planning, as I understand it, is a process of discovery it's not for people all by themselves. It's for people who are living in the context of uh, friendships and commitment. It's a process that is founded on listening and builds action confidence, builds the confidence that if we do something, we can in fact make a difference to the future. And what I want to suggest is a really simple set of self-tests that anybody who's participating anywhere in a person-centered planning effort can ask themselves. So the first self-check question is, what are we reaching for? And the second one is, how are we listening? And the third is, who are we engaging? So these are three questions that if you're a person with a disability who's experienced person-centered plan, experiencing person-centered planning, you can sort of check, check your reach, check how well you think listening is going, check how far we're reaching to engage other people in helping to shape a desirable future. I want to start kind of far away from person-centered planning. This uh, is uh, a shot from Gorsmorn National Park in Newfoundland in Canada. And uh, if you just looked at this tree all by itself, you could imagine that there was something pathological, that this was somehow a, a sick tree or a misshapen tree or a crippled tree, as a number of the people who talk about this 
would call it. Uh, but once you know that it's ad adaptation to the prevailing wind, it's life asserting itself in the force, in the, in the face of very high winds that come in a consistent direction on the, off the Newfoundland coast. Then you begin to see this in a different way. And the folks call this Tuckamore. There are whole forests of Tuckamore along the coast. And they're a testament to the power of life. What does that have to do with our topic today? Well, I want to suggest that people with developmental disabilities have made unbelievable progress in the last 75 years. And social exclusion is still a powerful force, a high wind that's blowing up against us that wants to distort our lives and that we have to be adaptive to it. Social exclusion is made of diminishment, of seeing people as less than human. It is enforced through discriminatory treatment. It's enforced by a culture of surveillance, a notion that people with developmental disabilities aren't safe unless they're under the control of people who are authorized to be in charge of them. And social exclusion is backed up by violence. Now, We've made so much progress that we sometimes don't notice that the wind is still blowing toward us and on us. And for at least the past 75 years, we've been in a period of resistance. Much of that resistance has been carried by the families of people with disabilities, by professional people who are uh, concerned to resist social exclusion. And for nearly 45 of the years by people with developmental disabilities themselves as they've gotten organized and practiced self-advocacy. So we got lots of things pushing back, many years and much skill of advocacy, victories in the legislature and in court, all kinds of inventions of new forms of support for people, research that's shown us new possibilities. And as we've been moving along, we've reached out because our first impulse to resist all these forces was to come together, to shelter each other, and to figure out to be of mutual support to others who share this experience of having yourself or somebody that you love excluded on the basis of a difference. So our first habit is in the blue circle to resist. And over the last 25 or 30 years, we've got more and more and more efforts, supported employment, ordinary housing, that kind of move us out into a broader community. But the purpose has always been freedom. The purpose has always been freedom. And we've been able to move in important ways from freedom from oppression, from freedom from the rigors and difficulties of institutionalization to freedom for, freedom to pursue what matters to us about our discharge of the responsibilities of citizenship. So as person-centered planning comes along, it's gonna 
meet a pushback from these forces of social exclusion. It's going to be uphill. And the more serious the challenge to social exclusion, the more it pushes back. That may not be your experience, but I share it with you because it's mine. So this power of resistance, the arrow pushing up there, comes from people with disabilities and family members and people who give their uh, life's energy, their work energy, to making real change for people with disabilities comes from people who want more. Um, I found this on the People First Nebraska uh, website. And uh, this is sort of one expression of the spirit of more. Travis says, I would choose not to, I could choose not to do anything and be a hermit because I'm like this. I think he's referring to his disability. But why? Why would I do that? Why would I be a hermit and not go anywhere, not do anything? It wouldn't be a life. And that spirit of more, that spirit of I'm going to push my way through those boundaries that could keep me in a smaller world and be a contributor to a, a wider community is the power behind person-centered planning. My first trip to Nebraska was in 1973, and I came with uh, escorting a delegation of people from across Canada to see uh, ENCORE, uh, an effort that is an expression of citizens who wanted more. Uh, family members organized by GOARC and uh, professors from the University of Nebraska Medical School, notably uh, Wolf Wolfsberger and Frank Menelisino, who got organized, mobilized a lot of citizens, pushed hard and came up with a comprehensive countywide system of services for Douglas County. And by 1973, they were a model uh, for the world of a group of citizens who were saying no to institutionalization, who were saying, we believe that we can make institutions unnecessary, that we can disperse services and supports throughout the community, and that we can hold ourselves to very high expectations of people's development. So this is uh, something that is an important part of Nebraska's heritage uh, of social invention, social innovation, and something that's, again, a spirit to draw on. We are, of course, in a very difficult moment in history. And that moment is uh, tough for most of us and very tough for lots of us. But Friday, when I was thinking about this talk, uh, a friend of mine in Scotland who works for an organization called Sea Change uh, sent me this uh, annual report, Our Best Days, Sea Change, sea change Scotland and COVID-19. And it begins with this statement. Amidst the sadness and pain of recent weeks, we have also had our best days, the moments when we've noticed one another as we have seldom noticed before. 
the moments where we've noticed one another as we have seldom noticed before. There's several things in this report I want to reflect on for just a minute. One of them is this notion that although Sea Change Scotland is an organization that for uh, about 20 years has only been a provider of individualized self-directed of, of assistance to individualized self-directed support, even though it's been committed to person-centered planning from the beginning, there have been moments in this very difficult time when we have noticed one another as we have seldom noticed before. That's kind of an interesting kind of bumper sticker for person-centered planning in my mind. Setting aside a time where we can notice one another as we have seldom noticed before. But here are some of the things they've noticed. One was most striking. Most people have coped far better than we predicted. Most people have coped far better than we predicted. So these are people who know people, who support people as individuals. These are people who've been staff colleagues for sometimes for years. And there's still more to learn. There's still more to know about who a person is when their environment shifts, even when the shift is a frightening and threatening one. Second thing, they said, uh, we're doing better at figuring it out with those of us who are not doing so well than we thought we would. Our fear is still with us, but we uh, have now got evidence that we're able to figure it out with almost everybody. And a key lesson for, key lessons for them include these, they said, we are reminded on reflection that we continue to underestimate people and we continue to underestimate all of our capacity to respond to new demands. We continue to underestimate our collective creativity and resiliency and we continue to underestimate the power of relationships. Person-centered planning in the presence of confidence in our capacity to respond and our collective creativity and resiliency in our, the power in our relationships can tap that spirit of desire for greater freedom and greater contribution. So I want to describe my notion of what person-centered planning is when it's at its best. Person-centered planning is conversation. It's just talk with occasional graphic recordings. It's just people talking. So if it doesn't lead if it doesn't generate, if that talk doesn't generate images of a desirable future that activate people, right, that lead to people doing things that they wouldn't ordinarily do, doing things that they hadn't thought of before they got into the conversation, then it may be a waste of breath. So it's conversation that generates images of a desirable personal future that activate and guide meaningful change in a social network. When person-centered planning's at its best, it changes the relationships around people. It strengthens, reinforces, challenges relationships between people who are close. Sometimes it challenges relationship between a person with a developmental disability and their family. Often it can challenge the relationships between people with disabilities and the people who provide direct support. It can expand people's social networks to include employers and landlords and neighbors and 
members of civic organizations and all kinds of people it can expand. It can prevent the shrinking of a social network, giving us the reason to reach out to other people when the wheels fall off our lives. So that's one idea about what person-centered planning is when it's, or does, when it's at its best, what does it accomplish? One of the things that I'm particularly interested in is finding different ways to look at things, finding different ways to see uh, common situations, different places to stand to look at them. And that makes me a big fan of uh, Marty Seligman from the University, uh, from Penn uh, in uh, Philadelphia University. Uh, He's a, a master of new perspectives in psychology. Uh, he's been very much involved in the development of uh, the notion of learned helplessness as an understanding of depression. He's been a leader in the creation of the field of positive psychology and about six or seven years ago, he started to explore uh, what he and his colleagues are calling prospective psychology. And there's a lot in that that's of interest to me, but I just want to pick the line there in the, over the sand at the bottom of the picture. What if, he says, what, what if action is not driven by the past, but pulled by the future? not driven by the past, but pulled by the future. People with developmental disabilities are at great risk of being in situations that are driven by the past. Sometimes I was talking with some people the other day about a person who's been chronically and persistently failed by our incapacity to match appropriate supports to her impairments. And one of her support workers was saying, I was thinking the other day, what it would it be like for me if people, other people's sense of me was driven by what happened on the worst day of my life, the worst thing I ever did. And this person carries a reputation that is, drives his situation by the past. Person-centered planning exists to provide a counterbalance. It doesn't make the past go away. It doesn't make trauma go away. It doesn't diminish the power of the winds of social exclusion. But it gives us the opportunity to project a future, to project an image of a desirable future that can exert some pull on a person's situation. Let me just take a minute or two or three or four and see if there are uh, questions that people would like to pose. No? Okay, we'll press on. So the first check question, self-check question is, what are we reaching for? And I want to make sure that you understand so that there, I think... There is a, there's a question, um, which is how might this uh, work for people who are, have communication difficulties or non-speaking? Uh, uh, the same way it works for anybody else. Uh, I understand that that would pose a challenge for uh, facilitating a meeting with people who had no reliable communication system. And I sure do know a lot of people who depend on other people's interpretations in order to make their 
sense of what matters to them clear. But oftentimes I find in the people who have the most limited, who, who, whom I have the most limitations in understanding, uh, to have the strongest life force, the strongest force that keeps that tree living despite all the ways that social exclusion bears down and bears down extra hard because uh, we haven't figured out how to understand the person. So that may not be a very satisfactory answer, but I think it applies with even greater force, the things I've been talking about so far. Doesn't mean you know how to, how to create the kind of relationship in which that knowledge can generate and flow, but I sure have seen it a lot of times when it does work that way. I hope that's responsive. Okay, on we go. Here are some legitimate things to reach for. Lots and lots of people, as person-centered planning moves into the center of the service system and becomes a requirement, becomes something that's a condition of receiving services that are funded by uh, waivers. Um, lots of people come to person-centered planning and what they're reaching for is to keep what suits me. And that's a perfectly legitimate uh, thing to reach for. It doesn't call for much effort on the part of the system and its impact is mostly on the person themselves. Person-centered planning becomes a real opportunity for people to negotiate a better fit with the services that they've got now or to get the best possible deal with a demand that the system is making on them as systems across the country move away from sheltered work or enclaves uh, toward more individualized arrangements. Uh, that's an important opportunity for people, especially people who aren't so sure about whether that's going to be a good thing for them to negotiate the best possible fit. Uh, a number of organizations have made a commitment to organizational change. They've noticed what Mr. Green pointed out, that as organizations, they're not offering what a number of people want. And so they need to adapt to change to sometimes they'll say transform their organization. And we've got a lot of examples of organizations recruiting partners among the people that they support and using person-centered planning to steer an organizational change effort. Reaching for a better story is critical for many, many people. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. So discovering a better story. And finally, building the community. And much good work can be done building the community of other people who share the experience, whether directly or as a family member or as a friend, who share the experience of a gathered community of people with disabilities and their allies and friends. Or we can begin to think about building the larger community. It's my personal belief that communities are diminished. All of us are diminished by social exclusion. And so those people with disabilities, with the backing of their friends, their families, their allies among support staff, who reach out to claim a place in the larger community, in the diversity of the larger community, uh, are people who are making a positive contribution to everybody 
it's maybe not perhaps as big a benefit to them because those winds of social exclusion are going to push at the person's life, but it's a contribution to all of us. So we can ask ourselves after engaging in a person-centered planning meeting, what were we reaching for? Were we reaching to keep things pretty much stable? Okay, that's perfectly valid. Were we reaching to cross boundaries and build the larger community? What were we reaching for? And we, I would hope that if you're a support coordinator or uh, somebody who is involved in a lot of person-centered planning meetings, that as time went by, you'd get a scatter, right? You'd find some of all of these, and most of them would probably down in the, toward the left corner, and that would be great. But I would hope that if you were involved in 20 person-centered planning meetings in a year, that you'd see all those things that people are reaching for, and some more besides. So the second way to think about what are we reaching for is, is it just for me? Am I the one that's doing the work? Is it just my goals? Is it for us? That is, is this part of some organizational change process? Or are we also looking for the creation of a bigger we, of a community that is more diverse, more inclusive, and more just. The extent to which person-centered planning is effective depends on three things. This is sort of the platform, right? It depends on time. It takes time over time. It takes time over months and sometimes years for images of a desirable future to shape the action that changes everyday life. It takes time for people to come together to learn to trust each other, to learn to listen to each other, especially if a person is, experienced, is in a situation where their communication is difficult for us to decode or impossible for us to decode. It takes a long time to learn a person's private ways. Flexibility matters. How open are we? Are we trapped inside some particular model of service? Are we trapped in a perception of people that are in a structure that creates group management rather than individual support? What about our reach? Can our person-centered planning process touch the direct support workers that people count on every day whose everyday action makes the biggest difference in the quality of those people's lives who rely very much on support. So we can take a, take a look. Now, one of the things that's been enormously powerful, although limiting, is uh, the power of families and increasingly the power of organized people with developmental disabilities themselves to claim a space outside the service system and to generate flexibility, reach, and time outside that service system. So powerful things can happen there when the larger system is short of time, short of reach, and short of flexibility. Person-centered planning rests on that material base. Finding a new story is fundamentally important. This is Christine Mayer. Christine uh, had a very challenging life. She was 
admitted to the first of 16 institutions when she was two and a half years old. Uh, she bounced from unit to unit and institution to institution, um, visited by an enormous amount of violence. And she bounced until she was about 28, 29 years old. And then she came to rest with an agency in Madison, Wisconsin that continued to serve her until she died uh, two years ago. So this is Chris. And Chris uh, came with friends of mine to consult uh, with a group of people concerned about folks whose behavior challenged them to extreme degrees. And she came as an expert by experience with what that was all about. And she worked very, very hard on her presentation and she put it in the form of what she calls my famous poem. And here's Chris's famous poem. If you are going to work with me, you have to listen to me. And you can't just listen with your ears because it will go to your head too fast. You have to listen with your whole body. If you listen slow, with your whole self, some of what I say will enter your heart. Some of what I say will enter your heart. What wants to enter your heart when you listen to Chris and the story of her life and the struggles that she had with self-regulation until the time of her final illness, uh, her, the medical condition that she died from. Uh, part of what wants to enter your heart hurts. It's threatening to hear and really take regard for the effects of social exclusion on even the best lives. And so one of the things we want to be alert for in our person-centered planning work is the dinosaurs that show up, that part of our brain that alerts us to what threatens us, to makes us scared, that part of our brain that closes down our capacity to listen, our capacity to imagine, and robs us of confidence. And just for purposes of exposition, I want to imagine this as voices, three voices. The first voice that we can check to see, did this show up, right? Did we listen with our whole bodies? Did we listen slow, right? Did we stop to think? The first voice that can show up is the voice of judgment. This is the voice that sorts things and keeps them away from us, right? That when something new comes along, leads us to say, that's not realistic, that's silly, that won't work, but this person couldn't. It's the voice of judgment. It's just not letting something in, but keeping it out because Judgment comes quick. Second voice that will show up in person-centered planning work meetings as it does in any kind of meeting, as it no doubt is right now, right here, right? These voices are adaptive. They tell us there's something here that's worth listening to. There's something here we should pay attention to. And the idea is not to pretend we can make them go away but to notice them when they show up and not let them be in charge. So the second voice is the voice of cynicism. We can't really do anything about that. They won't let us. The rules are too big. The money's too short. The workforce crisis is too acute. 
And all those things are accurate enough observation. The workforce crisis is acute. The question is, uh, do we have an image of a desirable future that pulls us strongly enough that we, we can build uh, a response to that reality? And finally, when we're really getting course to something that could matter, we find the voice of fear. We retreat into uh, a simple-minded and superficial appreciation of risk and a kind of risk management that is of very little help because it's inaccurate. So if the voice of judgment is at play, we're listening, our listening is at level one, right? And we come out of the meeting and somebody says, how'd it go? And you say to yourself, just about what I expected. Fine meeting, it was good, everything was great. No particular changes to come. If we defeat the voice of judgment with curiosity, if we practice curiosity as a purposeful habit that we generate, then the voice of judgment fades a little bit and we kind of open up to our second level of listening and we let ourselves get some new facts and new ideas. Oh, I didn't know that when she was home, she is able to do all these things that we're still doing programming to help her learn to do or Gee, I never heard of that method of augmentative communication. I wonder if that, that could have a place, even though I'm a little suspicious about it. So if curiosity works, we get new facts and ideas, and the voice of cynicism is likely to show up. If we are practitioners of compassion, then we can open up a third level, an empathic level of listening and get a new, a new sense of others' experience and how others feel, feel about it. And so not only our thoughts expand, but our hearts expand. And so we have the intelligence, both of our minds and of our hearts in order to appreciate the situation that we share. And then if we practice courage, we can still the voice of fear and come to a level four of listening, which is rare, but possible. Together in this time that we had, when we got together to just talk, to just talk in a purposeful and intentional way, to just talk as we practiced curiosity, compassion, and courage. Together, we generated possibilities that did not exist before. So, who's engaged in taking action? Just me? I'm going to work on my goals? How about my family and friends? Do they have things to do? What about the staff and the management of our organization? Have, are they taking away new assignments, new things they're going to do because they were part of my person-centered planning meeting? What about community members that we've recruited? What about them? Who have we brought in? Who have we engaged? So conversations generate images of a desirable personal future that activate and guide meaningful change in a social network. That's what happens when person-centered planning is at its best. And we can check, we can ask as we engage in the process. What were we reaching for today? How are we listening today? Who are we engaging with these plans? I think we've got a couple minutes for questions.
And a question asked earlier by Debbie was that she's working with somebody, it's hard to get them engaged in person-centered planning. She thinks, you know, maybe because he distrusts or fear or whatnot, but she's still struggling with um, not, not why he might be, but how to draw him into the person-centered planning process. And I thought she might have some perspective on that. Well, one distinction that matters to me is whose plan is it really? If I'm engaged with this, if I'm in the room with this person to meet a requirement, a system requirement, that's a perfectly legitimate reason for me to be there. But until the person trusts me and, most important, the other people in the room and feels like there's something that wants to be different, it's not his plan, it's mine. And that's why... I believe it's perfectly legitimate for people to simply be reaching for, hey, things are okay from my point of view, from my perspective. And as I looked at Nebraska's uh, core indicators uh, results, right, most of the people are pretty satisfied most of the time with what they got. Do I think that's going to move us very far into the kind of future that I hope for, no, but I don't want to disturb people who don't want to be recruited. So I would look at how open can I be? How open can my invitation be? Uh, how adaptive can I be to the person? How, in what other context beside this meeting am I getting to know them? Have I hung out with them? Have I shared a meal with them? Have I? And to the degree that I haven't been able to manage those things because of time or because of uh, flexibility available to me or whatever, those are just more things. They're not anything to be guilty about. They're just things to notice that affect uh, the state of the meeting. And sometimes just leaving somebody you know, just acknowledging that, hey, this is, this is a requirement that we have to get in, you know, that we have to, we have to meet in order to be able to continue to help you out. We're not pretending that this is for you unless you make it for you. I'm sure that's not very helpful. And another question is really, I think, on everybody's minds, which is, uh, I'll just read it. Any suggestions of getting parents to accept that their adult child is capable of so much more? They themselves are afraid. Well, I worry a little bit about the way that I don't worry about the concern, 
but I worry about the way that's framed as a question. Because again, it's a question of who is responsible for what. Um, there are lots of family members who from even today, even with all the victories and all the good things that have happened, there are that big arrow, that wind that I was talking about of uh, social exclusion is still a very powerful reality, I believe. We can see it every once in a while. It comes right out where we can see it, right, as we look at the enhanced death rate, the significantly enhanced death rate. We don't even keep track of it very well in the United States. In the UK, where they are keeping track of it, the death rate among people with developmental disabilities is significantly higher by multiples than the death rate for non-disabled people, not just people in nursing homes. And a lot of that is being triaged out of uh, the kind of care that might make a difference. So lots of families are hypersensitive. And if we're not listening at at least level three, <laughs> just to back up, if we're not listening, if we're not creating a social field that has room in it for that perspective, that perspective that says, I just don't, think this is going to work. Sometimes that comes out as, I don't think he can do it. The core indicator says, interesting to me, because the core indicators for Nebraska, reasons people can't work, health concerns appear to be number one. It's one of the places where your state results are different from the national average. Um, and again, if people are saying, I, I don't think she can handle it. I don't think she's able. If we don't have room for that in our conversation, if we're trying, if the voice of judgment has taken over, right? and we're saying, how do we fix that parent? And I know that that's not what you're thinking. It's just what it sounds like if we're not careful then I think we're in the wrong place. I think we need to be in a place of deeper listening. And let me pose one final question as we're, we're coming to an end here, which I think so many people have. Um, it's by Kristen Larson, who's the uh, Executive Director of the DD Council. But how do we help the person with disabilities be engaged and build social capital during this time of COVID-19 and social distancing? Or in my own words, it's this tension between wanting integration and wanting safety. And, your words would be helpful to, I think so many of us struggling with that. Boy, I wish I knew. Um, to me, my experience, I've been listening to lots and lots of people over the last six months. And what again, I have been inspired by is the number of direct support workers, the number of people who have had to shift their managerial roles, as my friends at Sea Change who produced that report have themselves now found themselves providing uh, direct support one, once again after years and years and years, is when people have that concern alive Often it's possible to find a way to keep some connection up. What's hard is to create new ones. We don't seem to have mastered the Zoom world uh, of building new relationships. We seem to be pretty good at holding on to the ones, uh, to many of the ones that we've got. And to me, it becomes really important to remember this is unlikely to be forever. It, it may well be for months and months more than we hope or want or think we can stand. But sometimes it's a 
temperature check to say there weren't that many relationships for us to keep alive when we were free, when we were not living under this particular shadow. And so let's remember, let's remember when things get back to a place where being mobile is safer again to make more of it than we have made before. And that's, I don't intend that obviously is any response to any particular person. I'm going to bring us to a close. Um, we really appreciate John, the extraordinary presentation that you've meant for, given to us. I want to share just a couple things that we'll be having uh, additional training and additional webinar. Um, we'd like you to uh, be come and be with us. We'd really appreciate that. All of you um, will be getting the links for the recording that's been done, and that'll be up on the uh, department website and available to uh, everybody to see. I want to just touch on just a couple of things as we wind up here. Uh, if anybody wants to just leave a chat of how today went in the uh, chat box, we'd appreciate that. <clears throat> We're in the process of training a thousand people across the state. We're right today, as we speak, training 100 DHHS staff and supervisors. We'll be training 600 service coordinators across the state. And in November, we'll be starting training for everybody. So we hope that you'll come be part of the actual person center training. For that next webinar is by Darcy Elks <clears throat> on the department website. You can register. She's another extraordinary um, presenter who's been um, um, working on this for a very long time. With all that, we'll send you a um, survey that we hope you'll fill out. And we thank you for being with us and we hope that you'll be with us in the future. Um, I'll leave it open just for a moment. Anybody else wants to add in any chat, we'll share it with John. And we thank all of you for being with us. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks again.